and we are live ladies and gentlemen welcome to the 28th ever episode of the best phone plans podcast i'm stetson and of course as always i'm joined by dennis dennis how are you doing today fantastic as always that's great to hear we've got a great show lined up for you today Dennis and I are going to be talking about AT&T's different priority levels based off of my AT&T speed test video. We're going to be talking about some news items, including Yahoo Mobile shutting down, TextNow's update on their free service, and some updates on the 5G networks. Tish's Project Genesis, T-Mobile apparently covering uh, most of all of the major highways with their 5G network and more. I think it's going to be a great show. I'm excited to get into it. Uh, so, Dennis, I think we should just kick things off with the AT&T priority levels. Uh, first off, I made a video on it. Did you see the video? I did watch the video. Uh, <laughs> I texted you, if you remember. I was like, I can't believe you actually brought the yeah. whole wooden table with you to the uh, park. or Not park. Uh... It, I would say park. It's, it's this lake. And it's called McIntosh Lake in Longmont, Colorado, if you wanted to look it up. And, yeah, what happened was, I mean, you saw the video. If you haven't seen the video, uh, I'll put it in the show notes. But what happened was I didn't have good AT&T coverage in my house, right, Dennis? Like, I was getting – it ranged from, I don't know, 10 megabits per second, sometimes even lower, like 4 megabits per second to, like, 20. That was it. And I was getting some weird uh, speeds on all the different plans. Like, uh, Pure Talk, a prepaid MVNO on AT&T, was actually getting better performance than Unlimited Elite, the top-tier $85 unlimited plan from AT&T themselves – which was super weird. Uh, and Dennis, I think I asked you behind the scenes about this, but what was your hypothesis upon seeing that of why I was getting such weird speeds in my apartment? Uh, my hypothesis was essentially that you, because the signal was so weak, you had minor fluctuation, fluctuations in your SNR, basically, signal-to-noise ratio, to the point that like such a small difference between like your phone being on this side to your phone being on this side closest to the tower would affect some of that performance. And it didn't really help either that you had all the phones kind of like smack dab next to each other. So like <laughs> the ones in the middle, you know, are kind of like, yeah, basically the signal was so weak that any little fluctuation in like a little blip, maybe that maybe a tree just died or something. And there's your little speed spike. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And I really appreciate you, uh, Dennis, for your insight into that. Like, I wouldn't have necessarily thought about that myself. And I was super surprised and kind of confused by the results. Um, so it was interesting to hear that perspective. So what I did is uh, I went to this lake, Macintosh Lake, because I'd been there before. I knew there was great cell coverage. And I took, it's this tabletop behind me, if you're watching the live stream. I literally took this wooden tabletop, this bamboo tabletop, put it in the back of my car, grabbed all six iPhone 12s, drove like 12 minutes down the street to this lake, Macintosh Lake, got it out of my car, set it up on a patch of grass, got my camera set up, and we did the speed test. Um, and from there, I learned a lot. Like I thought the video was super interesting. I had six iPhone 12s side by side by side, and we had all AT&T plans, elite, extra, starter, prepaid. We had, um, I know we had Pure Talk, and there was one more that I'm forgetting right now because I know there was six. Cricket. We had Cricket Wireless. Crickets in the audience. Um, and yeah, so from that video, I found there were basically three levels that I tested, but there's also a fourth because I was missing AT&T Business Elite and a AT&T uh, FirstNet is the other one that they offer. Um, what, but uh, Didn't you have uh, Carlos's plan to test out with? Okay, I did. Let's talk about those results in a second. I almost want to make a second follow-up video on that. Um, but from the video, yeah, Dennis, uh, what what was basically the takeaway as a viewer that you got from watching that video? I mean, takeaway was that Elite is like 100%. Um, extra was like anywhere between like 50 to like 70% of the speed. And then like Starter was roughly like 30 to 40%. But... The takeaway was that, you know, there were times where Starter got faster speeds than other plans, even though it was deprioritized, just because, you know, as a speed test finished, you know, there was capacity on the network, and so speeds were, you know, excellent and fantastic, and um, 
at no point when you were testing at the park did any of them actually perform to a terrible degree with the exception of uh pure talk yeah there was some very crazy like latency like over 2000 <laughs> millisecond latency uh and then also pure talk does have that 75 megabit per second hard cap yeah yeah i mean that's a great summary i mean basically there are four levels of priority on the AT&T network. You've got business elite, you've got, uh, that's priority one, that's business elite, and uh, Los Mobile is on there. And I think FirstNet is on the same level, but it's using some different towers, so it could be a no, little bit. Um, lo- um, FirstNet is even higher priority than business. So Oh, it goes, really? They split it? So it goes, FirstNet is the absolute highest of the highest of the highest that you could be. Then there is business plans. Specifically, like Biz Elite and like Los like mo- Los Mobile kind of stuff. Then you got your like normal consumer elite, your normal consumer consumer postpaid, which would be your extra, and then you got your deep priod. Yeah, so I think that's a, a great outline of the plans and the priority levels. So I think from there, like yeah, as you mentioned. Uh, top priority was at basically 100%, and then it kind of dipped off from there. And this also correlated perfectly with the QCI values, where QCI, so the QCI stands for Quality of Service Class Identifier, and this is basically a numerical value you can kind of assign to the different levels. And the ones we want to focus on are six through nine. So six is, as you described, top tier, first net, business elite. Then you have seven, which was consumer elite, eight which was extra and then nine which was unlimited starter and all the deprioritized plans and i think the interesting takeaway for me was that the mvnos are actually they actually have priority eight like they're the same as at&t unlimited extra it's just that they had that 75 megabit per second speed cap yeah i mean the takeaway for me again is really like with at&t qci values don't necessarily matter (laughs) too much their their capacity is so good it like it really doesn't matter like i saw some people in the comments saying they would they were considering not going with cricket based on those results or going trying to upgrade to elite dennis what would your move be i mean i know we know you love elite but like based on the speed what do you think you would feel comfortable with uh for usable speeds for yourself yeah i mean just to set the just to set like the, the 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 playing field straight you know i'm on a family plan with elite it's not like i'm actually paying full price for it I wouldn't go out of my way paying like a hundred dollars for one singular like magical line from AT and T. Um, as far as like usable speeds are concerned, I would say at least based off of current needs, anything above roughly thirty ish megabits per second on a phone for the download, and maybe like five to like ten ish on the upload, I'm pretty happy. Uh, and then what's more important, aside from the actual raw capacity, is that ping time stay, let's just say, 50 milliseconds or less. Um, that would be, like, the ideal experience for current-day Dennis and modern-day needs. Um, now, obviously, in the future, as things get more demanding, uh, I want to see actual improvements that come from like 5G and all that good stuff, and I think the bar will be raised. But I think that's a pretty good sweet spot to be at. I mean, you're not going to notice the difference between 30 meg and 100 meg when you're watching just a a YouTube video, you know? Yeah, you just need it streaming above 25, and you're going to be good to go. And yeah, I mean, I think it's that's it. What was interesting to me, Dennis, is looking at AT AT&T's priority levels compared with T-Mobile's. I noticed AT&T's priority impacted the upload speed as well. And this is something I didn't feel like I noticed as much with T-Mobile. Like if I had Magenta Max top priority on T-Mobile, and then I had something like T-Mobile Essentials, the upload speed from my testing uh, was about the same. And so for me, it seemed like T-Mobile really focused just on download performance. And then AT&T was taking a slightly different approach where they did both download and upload for both of their plans. Yeah, I uh, generally I find that AT&T tends to have the highest upload. Verizon can also have really good upload capacity depending on market, as we've seen from people like uh, um, <laughs> Sneem Mobile Tech. Sorry, I was yeah, blanking yeah. on the name. Uh, but yeah, T-Mobile's upstream is not great. But I think that has to do with the fact that they're relying on Band 71 as their main anchor band, and it's just skinny channel. Sure, I think that's probably sure. the reason. And lack of density, too. You know, Upload is... Uh, yeah, you know, we were talking about you know signal to noise ratio. 
your upload speed is far more impacted about that than your download speed will be. Yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, I think it was really interesting to see, really cool to get those results. And I agree with you, Dennis. Like, honestly, AT&T has so much capacity, you're not likely to notice deprioritization on their network as much as, say, Verizon um, or T-Mobile. And I guess the other thing that was interesting is how just how fast AT&T's priority levels were, right? So you said top priority 100%, let's say that's AT&T Elite. The drop down from that priority level to priority three, which is extra, that only dipped to around 65% plus or minus 10%. So I saw it range from 50 to 75%, which is way better than T-Mobile. And T-Mobile, it went from 100% on Magenta Max down to 30% was their next priority level. And then from there, it went down to 15% on T-Mobile. Whereas on AT&T, it went that 100, then it went to 65%, and then it went to 25%. So AT&T was kind of faster on their uh, lower tier priority levels, which was uh, really cool to see. Yeah, but I think that just kind of, I mean, that kind of comes down to like two parts. One, T-Mobile doesn't have as sophisticated as a network core as AT&T, so they can't really implement to that level of uh, fidelity, the kind of QCI values that AT&T's got cooking. And then I think the second reason just comes back down to, like, AT&T just has so much raw capacity, right? You know, T-Mobile, I mean, I know in areas where N41 is deployed, I know it's better. Like, I know it's gotten better. You know, it's it's fine and well and good and all that good stuff. But in the real world, you know, the world that Dennis actually lives in, uh, N41, although it might be splotted about with Microsoft Paint, isn't actually, like, in an any meaningful usable state unlike AT&T's network where like I'm regularly getting connected to like five carry aggregation between all types of different bands and I'm seeing the little 5G icon which is just LT advanced um yeah and it's good yeah. performance what was also interesting to me speaking of 5GE is that even though uh Cricket and Pure Talk did not get 5GE in their status bar they were still getting like the same speeds so is it does the icon even mean anything? Like, is there a difference or is it just LTE with a new paint on it? I mean, it's literally LTE advanced. And all the AT&T did is they just rebranded it to make people be like, ah, oh, you know, this is noticeable. But, I mean, it, the same thing happened back in the day with when we went from 3G to LTE. If you remember, we had that little bit of a middle ground where everybody was talking about HSPA Plus or 4G. You know, T-Mobile hyped it up because they didn't have LTE. And uh, AT&T was doing it just to have those sweet marketing ads about how they have that fastest 3G and 4G network compared to Verizon. So, yeah, yeah. So that's the same. All right, uh, Dennis, Los Mobile. Are you interested to hear what was going on here? Yeah, I'm very curious. So uh, I think I saw Carlos in the chat and I want to welcome him. Carlos, I did a speed test of Los Mobile. And for those who may be unfamiliar, Los Mobile is Carlos's plan that is offering business level priority okay you're getting top dog qci6 level prior priority only thing higher than this uh, from what dennis was saying is first net and i had this on eSIM on the same iphone that had at&t unlimited extra in it so i was doing the speed test i was like wow this is really cool to see now i wonder what happens when i turn on unlimited uh, or when i turn on lowest mobile rather so i turned it on uh, and it was actually getting the same speed as AT&T Unlimited Extra. And I have footage where sometimes it was getting uh, the same uh, speed as AT&T Unlimited Starter. And it was getting worse speeds than Elite. And I was Did like, you... what could be going on here? Oh. Well, I have a hypothesis, Dennis. Uh, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts after this. But I was talking with someone on Reddit, a uh, link to a post. And the summary of the post uh, is that... Well, maybe I can just read it. So it's from patentlyapple.com, and here's the quote. Apple's invention covers devices and associated methods for operating a dual subscriber identity model module, SIM, dual standby, DSDS, user equipment device, UE configuration with a first SIM and a second SIM. UE performs communications with a first cellular network using the first SIM and a first radio resource control RRC connection and receives a request to perform a higher priority communication using the second SIM. In response, in response to the request to perform the higher priority communication, the UE transmits a request to the first network to suspend the RRC connection. After transmit, transmission of the request to suspend the first RRC connection, 
the UE receives a message from the first network to place the first RRC connection into an inactive state and initiates a timer wherein the timer is used to determine whether the first RRC connection remains in an active state or transitions to an idle state. And the synthesis of this, which was kind of wordy, is that it's possible that the second RRC connection, that second eSIM card that was Los Mobile, may have actually copied the QCI value of the first SIM card from the first connection. And so I think because I was switching so quickly between these plans, one, then immediately the other, and then running the tests, I'm thinking it may be possible that the device actually didn't get uh, reprogrammed to the proper QCI6 level that it should have been on for Lowest Mobile. Dennis, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on this hypothesis? Uh, it's a valid hypothesis, a hypothesis. Uh, and it sort of goes with my first thought of like, did you cycle airplane mode to try to like reset the connection kind of deal? What I did is I actually, I reset the network settings in the phone and mm -hmm. I also rebooted it because I thought that would do it. Um, and again, I was there for a limited amount of time. I mean, it took me so long up until this point in the video, I was there for like an hour filming and I was like, okay, like this isn't working. I kind of want to go home. Um, but because it just wasn't working and I wasn't sure like how much longer it was going to take, uh, I only really like I reset the network settings and I restarted the phone, but it was still getting uh, less performance than I would have expected. Also, I just want to say real quick in the chat, Carlos actually answered for us. He says it's because with eSIM, the digital SIM is limited to three way carrier aggregation, not all five carrier. Oh, aggregation, like the this is amazing. See, I never would have known that. Yeah, I didn't know that was a limitation either. That's uh, quite perplexing. Uh, but I guess it makes sense to a certain extent. Um, hopefully that gets ironed out with, I mean, I'm just going to say this, this is why I don't like uh, Apple phones for testing because you would have had no way of knowing that, right? Like you don't have that in-depth, um, what do you call it? Uh, service mode tool. Like you do with like a Samsung device where you can see, like, that's a very apparent issue that you can see, right? If you were to dial yeah. in, um, but Hey, at least we know now for the future. Uh, exactly. and that's definitely good to know. And yeah, Carlos, I think I'm, I may have to contact the Los Mobile team and order a physical SIM card to try and properly test this out while I have all the other plans active as well. Um, and I think I'm also trying to get a, um, a FirstNet plan as well, uh, because I think that'd be really interesting. I don't have anyone I know who I, I think could get access to that. So I'm trying to work with some people online. I may try and uh, see if any family members may be eligible. Um, but yeah, that was that was kind of it. And yeah, Dennis, I guess final thoughts here. What were your uh, thoughts on me using all iPhone 12s for this? I mean, it's you. It was readily available, and, and iPhones do play nice with pretty much all carriers. So I think it was a fair... Uh, I think it was fair. I think it was fair. Uh, especially since AT&T tends to lean iPhone anyway. Uh, it doesn't like struggle like T-Mobile does tend to. Uh, I will just say... I mean, we talk behind the scenes all the time. I mean, in an ideal world, you would have had, you know, S21s, right? Because that has the most latest, you know, modem, right, baked in uh, to get the absolute peak results. But for all intents and purposes for what the test is trying to measure, I think it was fine. Sweet. I appreciate that. Yeah, I saw other people commenting on uh, getting S21s, which I think actually would have been cheaper than the iPhones uh, because the S21s just dropped so quickly in resale value, you can get them used on Swappa. Um, but I knew iPhones held their value and the AT&T network is actually the first network the iPhone launched on. So I thought it made sense, like more iPhone users are likely gonna be on the AT&T network. Uh, let's just do a real world test. Like no one's gonna be going into their phone, limiting their device to a specific band uh, while they're using the network, right? So, I And I think it's also fair just to say too, like lab tech, <laughs> lab test results don't really matter right like one of the one of the beautiful things about the content that you produce or we produce in general is that we're talking real world right like sure we we take the opportunity to try to get ideal connections as best as possible within our markets but like you know any carrier can look great if you drive hard enough i mean like try to find a millimeter way at&t site man it's like finding a needle in a haystack but if you find one you can make at&t look fantastic right <laughs> Yeah, I wish I so I wish I was able to do that as well, just to show like if prepaid plans had access uh, versus the postpaid. And it turns out that AT and T, a, a 5G plus is what they're calling their middle millimeter wave configuration. It's only available in one stadium in Colorado, 
I went to the stadium. I walked all the way around it. Couldn't pick up signal because it's all pointed inside. It's all interior for this the fans. So I would have to, like, I would have to go to a game or something and like bring a camera and six phone. So either way, I think that that's it for this segment of the podcast. AT and T's prior levels explained. Uh, get subscribed for more testing. Uh, it sounds like Carlos in the chat. We're gonna DM behind the scenes and get stuff sorted out to to get some more plans and some more content up, and hopefully do a better test for Los Mobile and possibly FirstNet as well. So. And before we before we move on from this topic, I do just want to give a shout out. Uh, Carlos did hook um, me up as well with Los Mobile, and I just want to say I had a great opportunity testing it out. Seriously, guys, if you're looking for a really good uh, true unlimited plan, especially if you need like unlimited hotspot or like a internet connected device, maybe you live somewhere where internet access isn't good. Definitely recommend checking out Lowe's Mobile's plans. They're really good. They're really well priced, and you do get fantastic performance if uh, you care about those high priority levels. Awesome, awesome, yeah. And I'm excited to see what kind of difference uh, that makes because it'll add like this fourth tier that we haven't uncovered yet. Uh, it'll be like over 100 percent based on my previous numbers. All right. But- but uh, moving on from that, uh, you want to talk about what Dish did this week? I actually, I wanted to talk about Yahoo Mobile um, mm. and then get into Dish, if that's all right with you. All right, let's do Yahoo Mobile real quick. This this is a quick one, Dennis, all right? Yahoo Mobile is shutting down no later than August 31st. I saw this uh, story on Best MBNO, and uh, this was actually really funny to me because... Uh, I had a lot of people previously asking about Yahoo Mobile, what it is, and if like if it's good, should they sign up? Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, Yahoo Mobile basically was offering a $40 unlimited data plan on the Verizon network, and it was a clone stamp of Visible. Like it literally said, service is provided by Visible, exact same features and performance, uh, and I don't know, like the app was a clone, the website was a clone. And uh, what didn't surprise me is I had a lot of people asking about it. So I was like, all right, I got to make a video on it. Why not to sign up for Yahoo Mobile? And you're like, Stetson, like, like, why not? It's, it sounds good, right? Like 40 bucks, unlimited data, Verizon. That's pretty good, right, Dennis? Uh, yeah, until you realize that you could get that same plan for $25 using your group party pay system with Visible. Ah, uh, Dennis, that was such a good segue. Yeah, so Visible... Literally, it's the same service. Visible is offering the service under the brand Yahoo Mobile and Visible. The only difference is that Visible offers their party pay group discount where you can join the best phone plans party and literally pay just $25 a month flat for unlimited data on the Verizon network. Save yourself 15 bucks. That's over $150 a year. Exact same plan. Uh, So I made a video like, hey, just please don't sign up for this get visible instead wrote a blog post on it so i'm not surprised at all that this plan is shutting down i think that's all we need to say about it like there's not too much rest in peace one of the many 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 failed mvnos that are out there. <laughs> yeah uh, but uh nice but, try but uh yeah i want to talk about dish though because yeah, we Dennis, actually you're, got oh, you're excited about dish what's going on yeah so dish actually exists they made a website what no yeah, way. right right yeah they made a website uh uh for their cell phone service it, and uh basically the the website's launch.5gmobilegenesis.com uh it takes you to a little welcome page that says project gen assist and they're all edgy with the five for one of the s's and it just shows like a bunch of people like doing one of these you know democratizing 5g I'm just excited because Dish is actually making traction. Like, I'm glad they're finally going to start offering plans. I'm glad to see that we actually have a competitor that's going to be trying something. And I look forward to seeing what happens with it. I mean, I've just to be clear here, I've said many times on the show, I don't have that, like, ecstatic of high hopes. I think more likely than not, Dish is going to fill in the shoes of what a Sprint did, which is more of a price control more than anything else, but never something I actually consider using. But I'm all for competition. I'm all for, I'm all for choices. And you know, let's see if uh, Dish can surprise me. Although I'm again, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. What's What's really funny is I got an email. All right. So uh, I'm part of the Boost Mobile partner program. They have their own affiliate program. Uh, and so I got an email uh, about this 5G network. 
And the website just looked so sketch to me. And the reason it looks sketch is because there's no information about the plan. It's a single page. There's only one button that says request access. Project Genesis or G G Gene 5 is or whatever. Like it was, it looked like just this up and coming MVNO that had branding, but like didn't have a plan. So I was, I was super concerned and confused about it. Dude, um, when you Google search it, it takes you to a video game. So that's a big, <laughs> that's a big issue. They probably want to yeah. maybe fix that domain. <laughs> and yeah, the actual root domain 5g mobile genesis.com doesn't even have a site like it's only the subdomain launch dot 5g mobile genesis.com that has a domain but uh i will just say this uh i'm i'm just interested to see what dish is going to do because they do have assets uh but i'm more interested in what happens with the network because after our podcast last week with ting that did give me a little bit more faith that uh, the billing system and everything else is going to be pretty spot on. Yeah, yeah. Actually, let's talk about that, Dennis. I have a hot take that Dish could be really good. Hear me out. Dish acquired Ting. Ting has a phenomenal back end. Customer service and support, billing and plans. I don't really know what else goes into a back end, but I know those two elements are rock solid. So Dish theoretically has the capabilities for excellent customer service and support. Then they acquired Boost. All Boost has is subscribers and branding. The plans are currently pretty bad, um, but subscribers and branding. And then Dish, the third piece of this puzzle, Dish is building their own network ground up 5G only. So they don't need to deal with the other technology. Am I mistaken here? No, yeah, yeah, you're right. I just want to interject real quick about three quick points. Okay. One, you were talking about Boost Mobile as if it was an actual positive branding. I don't know if Boost actually has a good reputation amongst most people. Okay, that's that's probably true. Um, I mean, it's it's known as the budget option, right? You don't think of it as something you want to go to. You go to it because you don't have, you want something affordable, right? Um, two, um, I do think they have a lot of potential, but one of the two of the big problems is is one, they don't have the raw capex right like they lack the base their main their main profit margin right that comes from cable is shrinking and dying so they don't have a lot of revenue coming in right now to be investing like verizon and at and tr or even t-mobile like their capex is only like 10 billion for like the whole darn thing and that's what everybody else is spending like every okay. year from yeah that is concerning that is concerning uh and then also to just follow up on that a little further the assets that they do have for a wireless network, I think, can be very strong for the amount of consumers that are going to actually be on the network. But I don't think they have enough assets. Like, I don't think they have contingent spectrum or spectrum that is quality to actually achieve, like, Verizon level growth, if you get what I'm saying. Do you? So when you mean uh, the quality spectrum assets, do you mean the size of the blocks of the spectrum that's next to each other or, like... Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. So, like, Dish's Holdings and Spectrum, it, it it's very fragment. Like, it's it's not like they can just do, like, willy-nilly carry aggregation with everything that they have. There's some things that just aren't going to play nice with each other. And they don't have large, big, fat, like, 100 megahertz contingent spectrum C-band like Verizon does, right? Yeah, so, so that's, as an analogy, that's like a four, that's like a six-lane highway, let's just say. And Dish, it sounds like, has maybe like a three or a two lane highway with their uh, spectrum holdings at the moment. Right. Like they got a little bit of, I want to say, I think they have a little bit of 800 megahertz, a little bit of 600 megahertz that they've been like leasing off the T Mobile in certain markets to use during the pandemic. I think they got a little bit of mid band. Like, but like overall, if you look at their actual spectrum holdings in comparison with the other three, like if this was like last generation LT market, sure, great. But now, eh, yeah, no, I mean, literally, like, Verizon literally has 100 megahertz of just C-band alone at the moment, and they're yeah. hungry for more, you know? I know. That was that was really awesome to see. So, all right, good good counter arguments. I will say, though, I mean, Dish can start 5G, standalone 5G. They can use the virtualized network core, so it's easier, more affordable, faster to build out. And I don't know. I'm, I'm optimistic at this point, Dennis, and I'm excited to see what's next. I mean... Just to clarify again, I think they can have a good network. I just, 
I think it's going to be purport in proportion to their customers. Like, think back to T-Mobile back in like 2014, 15 ish, before they had like that explosive growth. If you remember, T-Mobile used to talk about how they had the fastest LTE speeds, right? Well, why did they have the fastest LTE speeds? That's in. It would have been like one specific block they had in like one market. No, because they had the least amount of subscribers. <laughs> oh, duh. No, yeah, like because like legit. If you think like think about it for a second, right? It's real simple math, right? How much spectrum do you have? How many subscribers are counting, uh, connecting to that cell site, right? It's a big old pie. If I'm the only T-Mobile customer in my small town of like 700 people, then of course I'm getting like 75 megabits per second on band two, like 10 by 10, right? But when people go up to the racetrack and there's like 3,000 people in the small little town, of course, my speeds are so bad that I'm actually disconnecting from the cell setting key and place a phone call. Like, and I feel like that's going to be where Dish kind of somewhere falls in that ballpark, right? Like, they're going to get big. They're going to get, you know, sustainable growth somewhere around maybe 50 million subs, something respectable like that. I could see that happening. I just don't see them ever getting to the point of like 110 million subs without like a lot of extra gas in the tank i think they need i see better i need i think they need to do a spectrum swap maybe with somebody else maybe maybe they can trade with verizon or somebody kind of like what t-mo will do whenever they did band 12 remember they traded like i think it was band 2 for band 12 with verizon back in the day did maybe a little could, hot swap yeah maybe they could do something like that um or they could just become a really strong regional player like the way they're laying this up right now they're very like region based yeah maybe, i think uh las vegas is going to be the first market to get it yeah, I mean, maybe maybe Dish takes a very tactical approach, really focuses on, like, urban markets, maybe, like, 50, 60 markets, and they just do those markets so well that if you didn't pick them, it, it, it'd be crazy. Maybe they go that approach. I, I mean, I'll wait and see. Basically, yeah. I haven't seen anything on the table yet. It's been a couple years. I know it takes a while. I'm just waiting for something. Ting got me at least excited. I'll give Ting that. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I'm optimistic, and I'm excited to see what happens next. Uh, I think just as a quick recap, Dennis, what DISH is aiming to do here is their goal is to have 20% of the U.S. population covered by June 2022. So that's going to be in, is that next year? Yeah, that's literally in 365 days. So that's, you know, that's a start. They're probably going to be focusing on cities to achieve that. And then they have a goal of covering 70% of the U.S. population by June 2023, so in just two years. And hopefully they're launching in Las Vegas in Q3 of this year, 2021. So that's Dish. Uh, you, I wanna say one more thing on the Dish topic because I just had a thought. When T-Mobile was like first starting out after they like the, the whole merger failed between them and AT&T, they got a bunch of Spectrum and stuff like that, remember? But they also got a roaming partnership with AT&T as well, right? And still to this day, there's places where T-Mobile roams with AT&T. If Dish can work out some kind of agreement with T-Mobile, where they still roam on T-Mobile for a lot of their network, then I can see Dish being very epic. Because now they have a ton of extra capacity in those urban markets where it matters. But in those like unprofitable or hard to reach places, they're gonna just take a lot of time to do. They still got the team, the supercharged T-Mobile network to rely on. Uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, it's launching in Las Vegas, hopefully Q3 of this year. Uh, and Carlos is mentioning that hopefully it's it's coming uh, end of August for them. So you can check out Carlos S Tech on YouTube for up to date coverage and news on Dish. And I think the final thing is if you're interested, uh, the Project Genesis web website. As sketchy as I thought it was when I first got the email, it is legitimate. You can enter your email and get on their mailing list so that you will get notified when 5G service is available in your market. I think the other, I mean, I'm just thinking about this now, Dennis, but like the other kind of caveat with Dish is you're going to have to have a 5G phone to use their network. There's no other way. Yeah, I mean yeah you're right you're right how, like how is that going to impact subscriber growth and, and gaining new subscribers that's going to be a hurdle that the other carriers don't have a oh man for. and and dennis they have freaking boost mobile like all of those poor subscribers who are concerned about the 3g network being shut down i mean we talked about this on the ting episode i mean it's going to be a challenge and there's only really one i mean 
it, it, it can only go one way. I mean, it's basically like you accept that you're going to lose some people. For the ones that are going to be willing to stay through the growing pains, you have to have a replacement device method in place of some sort. You know, maybe it's a Galaxy A25, 5G, or whatever it is. Um, and you just move on. Like, it's just part of the growing pains, you know? Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Well, uh, that's Dish. That's the update on their network. I think we should talk about T-Mobile uh, next, Dennis. We had a, a story come out that T-Mobile is... Uh, actually the number one provider when it comes to 5g coverage across the interstate highway system apparently I feel like we should put in uh they claim to be okay okay i like that dennis t-mobile is claiming they have the most 5g coverage on the interstate highway system covering 92 percent of highway miles with hmm. t-mobile 5g hmm hmm uh, Dennis, you're kind of chuckling over there. What, what are your initial reactions? Uh, they should. I don't know how T-Mobile does their accounting, but if the person that does accounting is also doing the math for coverage, they should fire them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I had a few reactions to this. First was like, there's no way that's true. And then I was reading it and the way it's phrased, it kind of makes sense. And so I just want to kind of break this down first. They're only talking about 5G. Okay, and yes, when you specifically look at 5G networks, Verizon is using DSS on their network, so their 5G footprint is relatively small, and they also are using millimeter wave sites, so it's really only in cities, not on highways and interstate system. AT&T, same kind of deal. Uh, I, I almost think AT&T's 5G network is on pause. You can barely find it. They're using DSS in some locations, but they don't really need 5G. And that kind of brings me to the overarching point, like, AT&T and Verizon, their LTE networks already cover 99% of interstate highways. More than T-Mobile has at all, to any capacity. Mm -hmm. So so I think, um, yeah, I think T-Mobile is just using clever marketing here to try and hype up their 5G network. But we have to remember, like, you can't compare T-Mobile 5G to Verizon mm -hmm. 5G. Like, you need to compare the networks as a whole side by side. I mean, I actually just think these are blatant, flat-out lies. Um, you think they're just complete garbage? Yeah, I mean, if T okay, I'll put it this way. If T-Mobile said something broad like, we offer the most 5G coverage, or we offer the most 5G coverage across highways, fine. That's fine. The, the thing that gets me uh, is they say we cover 92% of interstate highway miles coverage, uh, covered. Uh, T-Mobile... How are you generating that number? Because your raw square footage of your raw square footage of coverage in the U.S. isn't even close to what Verizon's is, and I want to know what you're considering an interstate highway because I feel like you've just ignored all of like Interstate 79 in Pennsylvania and I-80 because uh, you most definitely do not even cover that with LT, let alone 5G, uh, in a full manner, and that's definitely a major interstate. Um, so that's where I take the gripe is where they're talking about like 92%. I want to know the math because I have a hard time believing unless they're like ignoring like a ton of different highways. Um, and I mean, Pennsylvania is a pretty decently sized state. So is places like Texas, you know, so is places like California, another place where I know T-Mobile struggles along the highway. You can go on their T-Mobile support page. These are massive amounts of miles that, uh, I just question it as well. And uh, I get it. Marketing going to do what marketing going to do. I just find this is going above and beyond and borderline lying to the consumer. Yeah, I I don't think it's lying. Like, I'm sure they're, somehow this calculation works out that it comes out to a 92%. Maybe they are ignoring certain things. Like, maybe they only focused on certain things. Uh, the data, apparently, in the image says it's based on analysis by T-Mobile of Ookla, coverage right from quarter one 2021 and speed test intelligence so apparently that's where they're getting the data the, uh from but yeah i think i think t-mobile they just... have a do they have a booster on the car like do they have like a little antenna booster <laughs> like like i <laughs> well i mean um, we did see that right for boosting verizon's 5g signal there are, there's already millimeter wave boosters going around um but yeah, I think for me, it's just misleading. Like T-Mobile is specifically focusing on 5G because they want to be the quote unquote leader in the 5G network era. But we just have to take into consideration that Verizon and AT&T 
already have wicked strong LTE networks and T-Mobile's 5G isn't really getting faster speeds or better coverage than those. Listen, T-Mobile knows what they're doing. They know marketing is one of the most important things. I'll give them that. But at the end of the day, if they want to actually get into the business space like they're trying to and try to uh, slurp up some of those delicious contracts that AT&T just keeps getting. In fact, at and has got another one recently. Then you know what they actually have to do? Actually improve the network. Uh, Because regardless of all the sweet nothings that you tell the consumer who might fall for it and buy it for your sweet prices, uh, you know, apartment of defense, you know, or businesses that are doing mission critical stuff do not care about anything aside from reliability. Like they cannot afford for something to not work or go down. And T-Mobile, you ain't cutting it. That's why you ain't getting those contracts. (laughs) I Uh, think that it's like you reminded me. So I, I recently did a video Verizon versus AT&T versus T-Mobile ultimate comparison. I talked about the different plans and stuff. Then like one of the number one recurring comments I see on that video is like T-Mobile is trash. Like T-Mobile doesn't work in my market. Like don't get T-Mobile. It's the cheapest, but it doesn't work. It's the worst. And so, yeah, I think like the ultimate, the bottom line here is that T-Mobile's network, it can be great in some markets. Like I don't want to fully discredit it, but the truth is when it comes to broad coverage across the United States and reliability, AT&T and Verizon are still ahead on those marks. And I also just want to clarify, despite the harsh criticism I just gave uh, T-Mobile, I will give them props. As someone that has had them for like since two thousand, like the beginning of 2013, they have improved tremendously. And if we lived in a void, T-Mobile's network is great. It's better than any network was a few years ago this it's just the problem is it's not a void and the also the other problem is i have a special sticking point in my heart where i don't want to drink the kool-aid and someone needs to be like the voice of the people i'm still in that quote from sneed and just call out you know you know you know what i'm talking about when they see it yeah 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 yeah. so i i think i think that's it that's the deal with t-mobile um what i you know what i really want dennis I want them to publish a map of where their band N41 sites are. That's all I want. Yeah, the uh, you know, speaking of that, I was actually reading an article talking about like uh, ultra capacity. It was like a really cheesy like hype piece, I could tell. But basically it was saying like like their ultra capacity N41 was covering like I want to say like 110 million pops or something like that. But then I was looking more into like T-Mobile's like coverage map and I think if I remember correctly T-Mobile only covers like 1.8 square million miles of the United States which I then looked up how big the United States is in square miles and it's something like almost close to almost 4 million square miles. So T-Mobile only technically has real coverage in about a little under half the US. Sure. I mean a lot of the US is kind of just like open land that doesn't necessarily need coverage. I mean, fair, fair, but there is plenty of roads and highways but yeah. in the in the Midwest that T-Mobile is claiming the cover that they don't have coverage in. Just huge, it's, big, black pockets of no coverage. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely true. Um, let's move on now. A couple updates on the Verizon side of things. There's a great story published by uh, Sasha at PC Bag. He was testing Verizon 5G at the Jersey Shore. And all I think is this is just a fun story where it shows you can get great 5G millimeter wave gigabit speeds on the beach now in New Jersey. And that's like, that's just fun, you know, going to the beach, whipping out your 5G compatible iPad Pro with Apple M1 chip, getting deliciously fast speeds and be able to bang away at work or stream 4K videos. Like that's the life. That's the life. That is pretty legit. Although as a person that's like a vampire on the inside that hates the light, I would not want to be trying to do work in the sunny, sunny beach. <laughs> that being said, no, but all jokes aside, though, that's awesome. That's super dope. Millimeter Wave works very well in beaches because it is such a open and clear kind of like. It's perfect. Like, right? Like, the cover, you couldn't ask for better coverage. You got the boardwalk, so you, you have all those different, like, little pier lights that you could just mount the equipment on. It's actually, like, an ideal scenario that I'm surprised more carriers aren't doing. Especially yeah. since once COVID ends, like, people are going to definitely be going back to the beaches. And those oh. things are so densely packed at times. It's so true. It's so true. And everyone's like, yeah, I'm not going to bring my phone to the beach. But then they bring their phone to the beach, they're on the phone anyway. And uh, Sasha was getting great speeds and performance. I think he said in the article, you could space the towers out one every three miles and still get superb coverage. 
and uh, great speeds as well. So I think that's great. Uh, the other thing that was kind of a nice bonus is if you're renting a house on you know whatever platform you choose to use, you don't necessarily need to get good internet. Like you can just use Verizon's ultra wideband 5G hotspot and be able to cover that. So I think that's super exciting. I also wanted to kind of pivot and talk about a little bit of an update for AT&T 5G. And all the update is here is uh, from Fierce Wireless. Uh, AT&T is improving their 5G speeds. Uh, they had a boost in the median download speeds compared to 4G, uh, but the latency performed worse. So AT&T is still working on their 5G network. Ultimately, I think at the end of the day, what this is going to come down to is we're waiting for the C-band spectrum to be deployed by AT&T and Verizon, and that's going to take their networks uh, to the absolute next level. So that is what's going on. And uh, those are those are pretty much all the updates I have. And Dennis, I know you had two great stories here. One was about uh, Google Messages for Android. So what is going on with Google Messages right now? Yeah, so Google added end-to-end -end encryption finally uh, for their Google Messaging platform, which is fantastic. I know it's something a lot of people uh, wanted because RCS didn't natively have that out the gate. So that's awesome. It makes it a very competent messaging uh, application. And then the other thing they added is like a star feature, which is also pretty uh, incredible. Yeah, so you can star messages and photos and videos and save them to uh, your phone. Like if someone sends you a message important, like an address or something, you can just star it. And it's kind of like a bookmark, which is really great. Uh, the other thing uh, I guess we should touch on is uh, US Mobile. Okay, uh, this just happened today uh, on Twitter. They announced an Amazon Prime Day deal where if you buy a U.S. mobile starter kit from Amazon on June 21st or 22nd, you get up to $250 back. And what the deal is, um, and what the deal is, is that if you're a new customer, you sign up, then you basically get 50% off your plan. And it looks like up to like $20 a month or something like that uh, for a total of up to $250 cash back, which is pretty cool. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of all I have for this show. Do you, should we like kind of try and wrap this up here and move on to the after show or like, what are your, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, didn't you have a couple other topics? I feel like, I mean, that's kind of it. I mean, what's the, what's the news indicator about broadband need that you have? Yeah. I mean, this was kind of cool. I wish I had more information on this, but basically we got an updated report on the gap in broadband speeds across the United States. So this is the indicators of broadband need uh, published. Uh, this is a map and it shows from different sources information on broadband availability within the United States. And this is a is an interactive map, which would probably lend itself better to the after show where we can kind of share Understood. this on, on screen. But Understood. Yeah, it, it's just like, what speeds are you getting in what locations and what are the performance levels and you can see surprisingly even in major cities uh there can be gaps just based on provider availability now i got you totally understood well uh before we end the show guys um i want to thank all of our patreon supporters for everything that you do uh if you couldn't tell this episode uh we finally got our green screens looking absolutely perfect uh and also, if you're not a Patreon member, I recommend becoming one because there is a ton of behind-the-scenes content and all kinds of other goodies that we have going on for you guys in the works. And I also want to thank everybody that was watching the stream today. You guys are incredible. I hope to see you in the after show so we can interact a little bit and show off this interactive map that Stetson has prepared for us because I'm very curious to learn more about it. Absolutely. Um, any final words from you, Stetson? Dennis, I thought that was a wonderful conclusion. I want to thank all of our existing Patreon supporters that helped allow us get to where we are today, create these awesome backdrops and green screens, and uh, make this podcast what it is, which is so much fun for both of us. So thank you all. Stu uh, tune in next time. We go live on YouTube every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you want to tune into the live show, we always love having people here. And yeah, 
That's it for this episode. I'm Stetson. And I'm Dennis. And we look forward to talking to you in the next one. Peace. Peace, guys.